Chris here from Practical to Tactical K9. This is going to be the first in a series of what I'm going to call dog talks. This is going to be um, a single subject video I'm going to discuss an issue uh, in the Practical to Tactical K9 realm. Um, try to break down some things uh, that uh, need to be talked about in the canine community. Uh, all of these talks are unscripted, uh, completely extemporaneous. I have no notes, uh, nothing to help guide this along. Uh, just 24 years of experience doing it. So the first thing is a little bit of housekeeping. I have no dogs to sell. I do not plan on selling dogs, importing dogs, breeding dogs for sale. So to get any questions out of the way up front about why am I discussing this subject matter? Why am I steering you in one direction or another or presenting this information? It's just so that we can protect the canine community, uh, keep the things that need to, to be moved front and center and steer away from those things that can cause damage uh, to the canine community, working dog community, and, and of course, private dog ownership. So with that being said, the subject of tonight's talk, the first one in our series, you think you need a bite dog, but you don't. Uh, there are a lot of companies who are willing to try to promote uh, training your dog to bite. Uh, people who want to sell you a personal protection dog uh, that is bite trained, aggression trained, apprehension trained. Um, there's a lot of vernacular in the working dog community, so I want to try to be precise, but then make sure that we're addressing all the different names uh, that things have taken over the years uh, so that we're clear on what we're speaking about. So when people say, oh, I want a bite dog as part of my personal protection matrix, how I'm going to defend myself and my family, I want a guard dog, I want a personal protection dog, I want a dog that's bite trained so I could use it in uh, the event that I would need to, that I had an aggressor who was going to do me bodily harm. And I understand why you say that, why, why you would want that but I want to explain to you why you don't need that and the reasons behind it and the personal liability that you can incur and then also the uh, liability to other dog owners and to the working dog community writ large. Uh, so why can I speak to this subject? Uh, I was a full-time uh, sworn and salaried law enforcement officer with a apprehension, bite train, patrol train dog. I have used uh, patrol apprehension, bite train dogs on combat missions in both Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, I have gone to multiple countries uh, outside the U.S. and taught patrol dogs to uh, other people. I've done it in Saudi Arabia, Oman, um, new, numerous locations. I've been all over the U.S., had interactions with agencies and handlers from agencies all over the U.S., uh, so a lot of exposure to this realm. As to your personal protection and having a dog part of that, let's start with what most police departments, uh, where they rank a dog in their force continuum. The force continuum is where an officer can begin using force all the way up to the end of that, that spectrum, that path, which is the use of deadly force, uh, firearms, and using firearms against an aggressor and assailant. A dog in the majority of police departments is considered, well, in all police departments, it is considered a less lethal use of force. Please take note, I said a less lethal use of force. How the term less than lethal got introduced into the law enforcement world and, in, and into 
even uh, the military side of things is a, a bit of a misnomer. We don't call these things uh, tasers, uh, chemical restraints, electronic restraints, canine and impact weapons. We don't call them less than lethal because in some uh, small percentages of these usages, they can be lethal. So let's just start right there. A dog is considered a less lethal application of force. In a lot of departments force continuums, the dog will land usually somewhere below impact weapons. So when we start, uh, first stop in your force continuum is always gonna be officer's presence. I show up, I'm in uniform, um, I represent uh, some law enforcement agency of some kind. My presence on the scene would now in most cases influence someone who is going to do something bad not to do something bad because now the law enforcement officer there represents the ability to intervene on my action if i'm a bad guy to take action against me physically to arrest me and then use uh, the power of whatever jurisdiction they represent to incarcerate me and stop me from what i'm doing so with that being said I do want you to make note of that about officer's presence and how we tie that into canine presence as we move on. So that's, that's the first stop. Then we're gonna have soft open hand tactics, pressure point control, putting your hands on someone. Uh, then we're going to generally move into either, depending on departments, don't beat me up, depending on the department, it'll be a chemical restraint, uh, OC or whatever spray that they're using uh, then we're going to probably look at electronic restraints, a taser. Usually now in most departments, we can start seeing the dog pop up into their SOP, standard operating procedure for use of canine. Uh, could be somewhere around this taser threshold. In most departments, a canine use of force is authorized before, <clears throat> excuse me, impact weapons. So believe it or not, Many agencies view using an apprehension dog as a lower step on the force continuum before you start using a PR24 baton or an ASP uh, expandable baton or other impact weapons that are authorized by any given agency. So keep that in mind where this thing rates. Then above impact weapons, uh, obviously we're going into fired uh, less lethals your beanbag rounds, um, rubber buckshot, things of that nature. And then ultimately we have the, uh, what's considered a deadly use of force, which is gonna be your firearms. Um, that seemed like that might be a little bit of sidetrack information, but it is important. We're going back down to step number one, officer's presence. Having been a law enforcement officer, you would be surprised how many times you show up and your presence is not enough to dissuade someone's bad decisions or their um, motivation to do something physically uh, bad to another party. Uh, why is that important? Well, because there is a potential consequence standing there right in front of them. And oddly enough, some people will choose to go ahead and act on their bad impulses with you standing there in uniform, clearly identified with your array of uh, options on your belt, impact weapons, chemical restraints, electronic restraints, firearms, uh, and the force of the law behind you, they will still sometimes choose to go ahead and, and act uh, in a way that breaks from societal norms. So keep that in mind. Now we go back to why would you want a dog? Well, I want a dog to be part of my personal protection uh, to be able to use it if someone were to aggress me, uh, to use it if uh, I felt threatened and I needed a dog to protect me. Now, let's go back to the force continuum. Anytime a police officer is using a less lethal option, hopefully they have a cover officer if you have a second or third officer available. If you do and you're not a singleton, you're not on your own uh, acting without backup at the moment because the, the situation dictates it, what are those cover officers doing? They are backing up the 
less lethal use of force with a lethal use of force top cover. If you are at a scene and you are using a taser, chances are if you have a backup officer, they are standing next to you with lethal force out, a long gun or their sidearm. If you are using a uh, beanbag round or rubber buckshot, if you shoot someone with a less lethal option, there is a cover officer standing by covering you with a lethal option in case the less lethal option fails. In many cases, you can find the videos, people say, well, a dog was uh, killed by being stabbed or being shot in a deployment for a police department or a law enforcement agency. If this dog gets shot or stabbed, chances are if this is a law enforcement agency, this was not a situation where the dog should have been sent in the first place. I'm going to be completely honest with you on that one. Uh, there's a video that can be found on the internet. There was an emotionally uh, disturbed person walking on the shoulder of a road carrying a long gun over his shoulder with law enforcement officers following him both in vehicles and on foot. This man is armed. He has the means. He's telling everyone, don't come near me or I'll shoot. Just leave me alone. He has demonstrated intent. He is within the range of the firearm he's carrying. He now has the opportunity, means, intent, and opportunity, the three elements that we require for some kind of use of force and how to gauge what kind of use of force is necessary. There was a canine officer on the scene. He sends his dog. The suspect wheels, points his long gun, and shoots the dog dead immediately on the side of the road. The police officer begins to wail and scream and cry out loud at the horror of seeing his canine killed right in front of him. This was not a canine deployment situation. Bottom line, never should have sent this dog. Um, now, on the military side, why do we send an aggression trained dog and an offensive capability into a building or situation where you have special operations forces present? because we expect an encounter, a deadly lethal encounter with people inside the building or, or outside as the case may be in open terrain. And the dog is out there to try to provide early detection for this person's whereabouts and to take some kind of offensive action on this person immediately once they locate them in order to give the assaulters who are present the opportunity to engage and, and neutralize, kill the threat. Um, the dog is not there to solve the problem. The dog is there to try to detect the problem early and to try to buy time uh, in law enforcement. It's called the reactionary gap, the moment that you have to read, recognize, and react uh, when there is a threat present. So on the military side, the special operations uh, forces specifically, that dog is out there to try to expand that reactionary gap. Another thing that the dog provides is putting uh, your bad actor, your aggressor, your enemy personnel into an OODA loop. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, observe, orient, decide, act. Uh, if this person is out here ready to do harm and they're waiting on assaulters to come to their position, they have their weapon at the ready. They have an idea of where this person may appear and what actions they're going to take at what point uh, when they see the assaulter coming. Once the dog is in the picture, now we have added something uh, that this person hopefully was not prepared for. And now the OODA loop begins. Observe, orient, decide, act. Do I shoot the dog? Do I wait for uh, the assaulter to appear? Uh, do I give up my location now by shooting to try to uh, kill this dog before it bites me? Uh, do I take the bite? How bad is the bite going to be? Am I going to scream out loud? All of these things now have caused this person to break from their original plan and try to assess what they're going to do given this new variable. That is buying valuable time for the assaulter deploying the dog to see the dog's reaction to see them moving and closing on an enemy's location to get ready and for them to have that extra split second of advantage that they need to be victorious in this encounter. Now, going back to 
you owning a bike dog. What is this bike dog going to provide for you? I just outlined that this dog is considered a less lethal option for law enforcement engagements. Less lethal options are covered with a lethal option as backup. This dog is not going to be a, a bite dog is not going to be a problem solver for you. Why is that? Let's go back to step one on the force continuum as it pertains to law enforcement, officer's presence. If that person is, if that officer is there and that person is still going to take bad actions against someone else, even with that officer standing there, they are committed to what they're going to do. How does that relate to you owning a bike dog? The dog is going to be with you. If there's an aggressor who thinks that you have something that they want to take and they want to assault you, they likely already see you traveling with this large breed dog. If the dog is considered a less lethal option and with officer presence, someone, some bad actor is going to act maliciously anyway, this dog is a less lethal option. The person sees you with the dog and if they decide to act anyway, you are going to have to ultimately defend yourself with some kind of a lethal option. Dogs are great. Dogs can do a lot in subduing an, attack, an, an attacker, but they're not going to solve the problem in its entirety. So if you are using this dog as your problem solver and you are not trained and comfortable and prepared to use lethal force in your own defense, the dog is not going to fill the role that you think it will. And, and with that being said, we're going to try to explain how you can mitigate liability. Now, am I trying to talk you out of owning a dog? Absolutely not. Um, for the last 24 years, my, my work world and private life have revolved around dogs. I'm not trying to talk you out of it a bit. And in fact, I'm going to give you a course of action for you to take to have a dog part of your life and part of your threat mitigation package, but it is not your problem solver and why you don't need it bite trained to be part of your threat mitigation package. So with that being said, let's go back to talking about how that dog interacts with you. Why do you not need a dog that is trained to bite in order to be an effective deterrent? in your personal security and your threat mitigation. I'm going to date myself a little bit, but I want to bring up, and for those of you 38 to 40 and under, here's your homework. Go back and research a TV show uh, from the 80s, late 80s called Magnum P.I., Tom Selleck. Um, there, there was an aspect to this show that is relevant to our topic at hand. The show takes place in the Hawaiian Islands on a very large estate and the manager of the estate is a British fellow in the series and he goes by the name of Higgins and Higgins has two almost twin looking Doberman Pinchers as part of the show and they're named Zeus and Apollo. Everyone in this show who is part of the show that sees Zeus and Apollo are always mortified of Zeus and Apollo. They are scared to death that these dogs are absolutely going to tear them limb from limb if they do the wrong thing. If you have watched all of the episodes as I have, because I love it, and then years ago Netflix had it and then took it down, so I re-watched it out of nostalgia because it's a great show, Zeus and Apollo never bite anybody in the entire show and yet everybody in the show is mortified of these two dogs. Why? They looked apart and they had laser-like obedience training. These dogs listened to everything the character Higgins said. Zeus, Apollo, patrol, here, sit, guard, look, go away, come here, sit right there. And they did it just like they were absolutely trained for the circus. So how did people think that these dogs were a threat? Because their mind took them to the eventual outcome they thought would happen if they were a malicious actor in the show. 
The dog never bit anybody, didn't have to bite anybody. Everyone mentally made the leap. If I am an aggressor, these two dogs, because of all of the training that I am observing that they are acting on, these dogs are probably lethal killers in the event that I do something bad. Therefore, I'm not gonna do anything bad and I'm going to show these dogs in most cases reverence and in some cases an irrational amount of fear because of the training they displayed in the course of the show. Why is that relevant? Because in your own life, if you get a nice, well-selected dog that is of good mental balance and social temperament and you seek out a quality trainer who can teach these dogs this laser-like obedience, where they're good in public, where you can take them everywhere you go. Uh, there are a lot of public venues that you go to uh, where dogs are allowed. I'm sure if you are a hardcore dog owner, you know of restaurants, pubs, coffee shops, eateries where you're allowed to take your dog. Uh, it's pretty much uh, public domain knowledge. Uh, dogs are allowed at Lowe's. Dogs are allowed at Bass Pro Shop. Dogs are allowed in Home Depot. Dogs are allowed in Rural King. Um, some places clearly say uh, pet friendly for well-behaved animals. So there are already a lot of places uh, that everyone travels where these dogs can go and accompany you. Don't be the a-hole out in public with a dog that's not well-trained and is causing a scene and is aggressive to other dogs and doesn't know how to behave. If you don't have a dog that is trained well enough to be out in public, do everybody a favor and don't bring it out. Um, if you are a dog lover as I am and you love traveling with your dog, Tractor Supply, another venue where dogs are allowed and should be well behaved. There's a Tractor Supply not far from where I'm at right now and I always take my dog with me to Tractor Supply. He loves the visit. Everybody loves to see him. This dog walks around and you wouldn't even know he was there if you weren't looking at him. Uh, but that's not the case of every dog that I see at the tractor supply here locally or anywhere else I go. Um, your dog should be an enhancement to your life, not uh, a liability in your life. Don't go out in public and have people giving you side eye or dirty looks because your dog doesn't know how to behave. I'm going to give you courses of action. I'm going to recommend people that I know of personally and ways you can go out and find people I don't know who are just as good that can train your dog and get it where this dog is a total life enhancement. They can ride with you in a vehicle and behave. You can get out at a petting zoo or go to the zoo and take this dog around other animals. Your dog should not be animal aggressive. There's no reason for it but you need to have this dog where it can be an enhancement to your life and you can take it everywhere. One second, a little pause for the cause here. Go away, Nat. Oh, that is nice. So your dog should be value added, be an enhancement to your life. You need to be able to take this thing with you everywhere. Now, how does it pertain to threat mitigation for you if that is something you're interested in your life or with your dog. Find a large breed dog that looks the part. You don't have to be breed specific. Uh, and in fact, I've even seen uh, Labrador retrievers uh, that had really good obedience that to uh, a large segment of society, people aren't gonna mess with you if you're rolling around with a nice big lab and he's trained uh, to uh, a high standard of obedience and he looks the part. A little aside here uh, to try to paint the picture for you and put it all together uh, because I always tell people when they approach me, hey, can you help me teach my dog to bite? Um, where can I get a good bite dog? I've told everyone my entire life, don't go get a bite dog. Uh, when I was in Texas training service dogs at the Warriors Heart Ranch, uh, one of the clients there said, hey, I would like a bite dog for protection. I said, let's do this. Let's take the dog you already have, which looks the part, is a good looking dog. The obedience training we're doing is going well. Let's do place training on a place board, which means you can direct a dog to a specific location 
and at first we use a raised platform then a small platform and then sometimes just a, uh, a small blanket or a marker on the ground let's begin with place training eventually we work the place training to go from a, a forward facing side heel to a six o'clock facing rear heel and we named this new behavior cover so when he was out in public he could tell his dog cover and the dog without having anything on the ground because we use the place training as the foundation to build the cover behavior the dog would take a rear facing heel behind the owner and sit there and look straight out behind them now let's paint the picture you're at Lowe's you come out with your purchase you go to your vehicle, you have a well-trained obedient, name it, German Shepherd, Doberman Pinscher, Bouvier, Malinois, whatever you have, and this dog, you say cover, and it goes behind you and sits down, faces six o'clock, 180 degrees away from you while you are getting things out of your car and putting them in your vehicle, and this dog is sitting, looking straight back the eyes in the back of your head, if you will, scanning the parking lot or just sitting there looking. Someone sitting in their car looking for an easy mark to go mug. Are they going to get out and go over there and attack you with that dog sitting there in a rear facing heel looking at the parking lot? No, no, no. And if they do, if they do, this person is committed to malicious behavior against you specifically for some reason. Maybe they like what you're driving. Maybe they think that your handbag or your wallet or something about you look particularly appealing. At this point, if you have a non-bite trained dog that has this level of obedience and they come to attack you anyway, the bite dog is not going to win the day. If you are not already trained and carrying a firearm and ready to use lethal, uh, use of force in your own defense, the bite dog is not going to carry the day. Could it help a little? Yes, but if this person has already started to close distance on you and aggress you with this trained animal sitting there doing a rear facing heel pulling security, I got news for you. This person is committed to do violence. And even if you had a bite trained dog, this is not going to solve your problem. Just period. Going back to when I was a police officer, um, I'm not a small guy, um, was 6'6 six, six in high school. Uh, once I got out and got on the police department, I wanted to be big muscle police officer. And to that end, at one point in time, I got up in 245, 248 and could lift quite a bit of weight and uh, was a very large imposing guy as a police officer. And without a dog, people would still think they wanted to fight me. And I would have uh, physical encounters with suspects uh, and criminals who were willing to fight me. When I got out with my dog, they'd never seen this dog in their entire life. They'd never seen him bite. They'd never seen me do a bite demonstration. But when I got out and presented a dog into the situation, Nobody ever, when I was a police officer, had a physical engagement with me when I had that dog present. People will fight a person. People do not want to fight a dog. If they do choose to fight the dog, they were going to fight you to begin with, and the dog is not going to solve the problem. I hope you're starting to put uh, the information together that I'm putting down here. Um, quick story, I went to a call at a bar uh, where the call came in to 911 that there was about to be a brawl in this bar. I knew the bar well. I had been in there. There was a partition that was about chest high on me that started at the door, and it followed a ramp down and then went to the floor of the bar uh, where the, the wall ended at the bottom of the ramp. I got there first. No one else was with me. I get my dog out. I go to the door and I throw the door open and I look over the wall at the top of the ramp and I said, I heard that there was uh, some people here who'd like to get into a fight. And I hear a voice from the floor of the bar say, well, you're just in time, come on down. So I went down the ramp and my dog was concealed behind the wall. 
And as I turned the end of the wall and came down to the bar floor and my dog made his presence known, everybody in the floor just parted. Uh, it, it just was miraculous how everyone cleared the floor and backed up against the walls. And I was the only officer there. And someone's comments from the top of the ramp about you're just in time, come on down. No one was ready to fight when I turned the corner with that dog. People generally in their right mind don't want to fight a dog. Even drunk people generally don't want to fight a dog. If they do, they were committed, predisposed to violence or malicious intent from the beginning, and the dog's not going to be the problem solver. If you go and you try to seek out bike training or a bike trained animal or people who sell uh, personal protection animals, they are going to charge you a ridiculous amount of money, way more money than you need to spend. If it's not pro uh, cost prohibitive to you, it's already going to be overpriced and you don't need to spend it. Here's another problem. Too many of these trainers don't go and take these dogs out into enough public places. They don't do the training to try to make sure that this dog is balanced and animal neutral, animal neutral. One more time, animal neutral. Your dog should not aggress or show aggression towards other animals of any kind, especially other dogs. Not horses, not livestock. This dog needs to be prepared to travel with you everywhere you go and not create a problem or a liability from you. There's a very famous case in the personal protection animal world where a bite dog was sold to a lady in Texas who had high-end uh, horses on her property and as soon as she paid a huge sum of money for this dog and got home and the dog had off-leash obedience put on it, she goes home to her ranch, takes this dog off leash and immediately this dog goes out and engages uh, a very expensive horse on her property. Epic fail. This is the subject for a different video. I'm not getting into it tonight. There is no reason a bite trained dog should be excused to have aggressive behavior towards any other dog. Oh, well they're bite trained. So it's excusable because they have aggression training. No, it is not. And I'm not gonna run too far afield and this will be the subject of another dog talk. Staying on point, these vendors do not go out in many cases and conduct their due diligence. What should you do? Go find a trainer. If you have dog experience, go pick your own dog. Find one that you click with that has the right personality and temperament for you. Then go seek out a trainer who can help you put the finishing touches on this dog. If you don't feel confident in picking your own dog, find one of these trainers with experience who can go help you pick one from a reputable breeder. Find a good dog with the proper temperament that is compatible with you and teach this dog to be balanced in all situations, to not be animal aggressive, to have good social balance in public, and to be able to accompany you everywhere. Then take that dog and mold it into the dog that you need to be able to go everywhere with you, have great obedience, ride in your vehicle, and not be an awkward social embarrassment when you're out and about. Be able to take this dog with you to friends and neighbors' houses who have balanced social dogs and have your dog there and know that you're not going to be an a-hole because you go to someone else's house and now your dog is being aggressive to your host's animals. There's no reason for that. It's just poor form. You don't have to live with that. Be suspicious of a trainer that tells you this is how it is, this is the way it's got to be, run away from that person. The other thing about these bite trainers, they're going to have you sign a release of liability form the minute you start putting your dog into their training. Why is that? When you go to a personal protection animal vendor who's going to sell you an adult pre-trained animal and part of that, that sales closing is going to be signing a release uh, waiver, a, a release of liability. Why is that? Because they don't want any blowback from what may happen when you go out with this dog and if it bites another animal or another person. If their training was so rock solid and reliable, 
Why do they need a release of liability from you before you go out? Hold on, I can hear people screaming at the video already. Yes, because there is a slim demographic of people who will reliably go out and do something stupid because they have a bike trained dog. I fully stipulate your point, yes there are. But for the majority of people, and let's call them the majority of responsible gun owners, who would also be grouped in with the majority of responsible dog owners, why would a responsible person who's not looking to go out and do something silly or wave their dog around uh, as a use of force uh, without the need for it, why would they need to sign a release of liability? Because this is a, uh, a high rate of liability if they are training and selling uh, aggression trained animals. So if there isn't potential problems out there, why are they trying to separate you uh, as a problem that could be their future problem? Ask yourself that question. If you're going to be a responsible owner, why are they trying to create a distance between them and you? So that, is all, that should already be a warning flag to you that they want to separate their personal liability from the dog that they're selling you to go take out in public. Um, if they're a, a shady trainer and your dog goes out and lights up a dog in public and you did everything they told you to do, now you're in trouble. The liability is you, is on you. And when you go back to this trainer and say, hey, I went to Tractor Supply and my dog jumped another dog and tore it up, they're gonna say, well, I've got this release from liability and that's a you problem, not a me problem. Well, this is an unreliable trainer who did not conduct due diligence, who does not know the full uh, spectrum of really looking at a balance. Look at the hummingbirds coming and going, I'm getting buzzed. They don't understand the full spectrum of how a dog should be selected, trained, and, and how they should be trained. Uh, you're gonna see a ton of people in both the working dog community and private aggression community tell you you need to train your dog so that when the handler is assaulted, when you're assaulted, that the dog automatically bites someone. This is horrible training. Again, a subject for a separate dog talk all to itself no, you do not need handler assault training. We'll get into that another day. I don't want to get too far afield. You do not need an aggression trained dog to be part of your threat mitigation matrix. Find a reputable breeder, find an adult dog, find a puppy. Well, I want one from a working line. You don't need one from a working line. Working line is automatically a reason you should suspect this breeder or suspect this trainer as being not fully educated or maybe even just a fraud. Working line does not mean diddly squat. Again, I have a whole array of dog talks racked and stacked by subject. Working line and the genetic lottery is a subject for a standalone video. It is a lottery and there are winners and losers and just because you had a working dog from a working line and bred it with another successful working line doesn't mean that every puppy that comes out of that dog is going to be working quality or even great. Does that mean it's not a good dog for you? If it didn't win the genetic lottery, absolutely not. The dog doesn't need the drive to be a working dog, i.e. a police department or a military working dog does not need it. In fact, if you are a private owner and you do not have hours a day to spend with this dog, it's going to be a hindrance to you, not a net gain. This is not going to be an asset, it's going to be a liability. A dog that is truly driven enough to go into a high-end working program is going to create so many problems for you, eating your furniture, getting bored, uh, all of the outlets that this dog needs as a working dog is not going to be present if you're not going to put a ton of time into it and you don't need a dog up there on the scale of this high drive working dog. If you got a genetic lottery loser who is a little more low key, who likes to hang out a little bit more and doesn't want to chase every car, every bird, every animal that it sees, but is trainable to a degree, you are going to have a much better experience. Get this dog who needs to go out, who has the physical stamina and the wherewithal 
to walk in your neighborhood, to go to the store with you, who wants to get out and participate in your life, but doesn't need, when I go to work on Monday, I'm going to grab three or four of these high-end working dogs, and the first order of business is they're going to uh, going to be on a four to six mile run at pace at an eight minute or so pace per mile to get enough energy out of this dog so it doesn't go crazy to then go and do actual training later. You don't need a dog in your life that's that high drive unless you are of high athletic aptitude and you have the time to go out and pound the ground with this dog. Uh, every other day anyway, at least, get this lower drive animal. There is no shame. I do high-end working dog training all the time with food, kibble, treats, uh, pepperonis, and a clicker all the time. Just because your dog doesn't chase a toy and isn't toy crazy and doesn't do reward object or toy training doesn't mean it's not trainable and it doesn't mean it's a bad dog. Meet the dog where it's at. Train it with food, train it with a toy, train it with anything this dog finds motivation to do things for, and train a really nice dog. Get the laser-like obedience in and out of your vehicle, riding in a vehicle, in your home, going to public places, and if this dog looks the part and has good quality obedience, this is going to be a very effective part of your threat mitigation matrix. It's not your problem solver and you don't need to spend the kind of money to go to a trainer to do aggression training or to sell you a pre-trained aggression animal dog. If you haven't been in the market, a pre-trained personal protection animal, you're talking well into the double digits, tens of thousands of dollars, 10,000, 15, 20, 25,000 dollars to some of these trainers. Some of these people who will tell you they train for professional athletes and Hollywood types, they can be upwards of $25,000. Cost prohibitive and no reason for it. Go find a reputable trainer. Go find Ryan and April in the Panhandle of Florida doing total dog training. Go find Todd Smith on the East Coast in the Mid-Atlantic uh, Maryland region, uh, Trinity uh, Canine Services. Uh, go find Jake Robinson and Off Leash Canine. Find reputable trainers with real world experience who can, for a fraction of the cost, do training packages to teach your dog that looks the part, the obedience that you need to portray that Zeus and Apollo type of laser obedience with this dog that makes people think, I'm not gonna go over there and act out in a bad way or engage in malicious actions against this person because this dog is going to bite me. If they do, the dog wasn't going to solve your problem in the first place. You're going to need to back that up with lethal force training and engagements. And if you are not comfortable carrying a gun and don't wanna carry a gun, this is still America and that's your call. It's not my way of doing business but that's on you and that's fine not having a bite trained dog was not going to solve your problem in the first place if they overcome their fear of your well-trained look the part animal they were going to come at you anyway whether this dog bites or not and let me let you in on a little secret in closing many many dogs will bite even if they not or not bite a train uh, attack trained in the first place. They will still bite given the proper surroundings and situation. Does that mean you should stake your life on it? Absolutely not. What does it mean? It means that in all likelihood, if you've got a decent large breed dog who loves you and you have good rapport and it has good training, the do again, sorry, don't wanna go too far afield, a topic for another day. Why do dogs bite? Do dogs bite to protect their handler? Are there dogs that are handler protective? No, no, no. These dogs are biting to protect themselves or because they're edgy and they wanted to bite and because they have rapport with you, you are the beneficiary of what this, will, this dog will do because the, does the dog live in uh, your bubble? No. 
you are allowed to live in the bubble of this edgy dog. And then in these cases, you may have the benefit of what this dog will do if someone steps in the dog's bubble. The dog is not biting someone because they stepped in your bubble. The dog bit someone because they stepped into his bubble and you happen to live in it. That is it. This dog is not, not biting to defend you for some noble reason. This is an edgy dog who allows you to live in their bubble and bit the person that stepped into his bubble. With that being said, if you have a non-bite trained dog who is well trained and has good rapport with you and someone grabs you and takes you to the ground and starts fighting you, the chances that this dog will feel threatened himself are very high and this dog will now bite out of defense or survival and likely bite this person with malicious intent because they feel threatened and now you will become the beneficiary of this dog's actions. If you have looked at any of my P2T canine YouTube videos or any of my Instagram videos, you will find our brand ambassador, Thomas. Thomas is a dog from the Kendall County Sheriff's Department, was found on the side of the road down in Texas and this dog has never had one iota of bite training in his life. He's never seen a sleeve, a jute, a tug. Let me tell you something. If you corner Thomas and you put enough pressure on him and certainly if he's around our daughter and you put enough pressure on Thomas, you're going to get bit because Thomas has a defense in him where he's not going to let a stranger roll him over, steamroll him, or let someone show malintent in his area because he will feel personally threatened and he will react. He will let anyone pet him. He loves kids. He loves every stranger. Uh, and again, more vernacular for another day from a separate video. Let's talk about the Ranger Handbook and using dogs. Non-threatening actors in a permissive environment. A well-trained dog should, who with proper balance should not randomly aggress towards people who are non-threatening actors in permissive environments. Everything looks normal and natural. Everyone around you is not acting shady or hinky. They are normal and natural. This dog should not react. They should remain neutral as long as everything and everyone around them are likewise neutral. You are going to be fine if you get a large breed animal get good training from a reputable trainer, make sure that they are neutral, well-balanced, and not animal aggressive, and you're going to have an effective piece of your threat mitigation plan. Thanks for watching. If you have an idea for a dog talk or a subject you'd like to see addressed, go ahead and leave suggestions in the comments. I'll take a look at it. Maybe it's something I already had in mind. Maybe it's something new I haven't thought of that I will, uh, I will give it a look and maybe do a video. Um, I'm not going to tell you what to do as far as you know how YouTube and the internet works. And if you feel so inclined to do the things that you do on YouTube and the internet, I'd appreciate that you do that. Um, thanks for watching. We'll see you again on the next one.